chapter 4 of Revelation. I'm reading from like a 300-year-old Bible for fun because it's the point of having these books if you don't actually look at them. Right? It's a really weird old version of, it's King James, but it's not like King James, King James. It's older King James because even though even the weird King James is not the King James. The King James is actually like late or early modern English or late middle English, whatever you want to call it. It's not our English. When you read it, she's like, this doesn't make any sense at all. This isn't that bad, but it's close. This is from 1698. So it's pretty old. All right. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a, a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Ooh, guess you're where I get that from. You know, beginning of sermons. Uh, I just lost my place. Uh, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for those, for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Man, that King James does have a beautiful way of it, doesn't it? Sometimes it's a little different. It's not that different from ours, you know, but it's just a little bit. It gives it that little bit of kind of, oh, that's nice, nice way of phrase. You got to get used to the long S's because it's like, it's not an F, it's an S. So it's why I have to pop. No, it's an S. How do you say that word? Oh, it's beasts, right? Okay. I, I, just, I, like, the, I like the way that sounds sometimes. All right, so in chapter four, now we're going to start getting into even deeper into symbolism, first of all, using this picture language from the Old Testament, uh, which is also our key to decoding it and understanding it. So you really ought to read Ezekiel chapter one. Why don't why don't we read Ezekiel chapter one? I should usually look at my notes before and say, before we read chapter four, we're going to read Ezekiel chapter one. It doesn't really matter because they're both weird to us. So Ezekiel 1 is pretty cool. So Ezekiel chapter 1. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Shabar Canal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to a Jeho- Jehoiakim. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Kabar Canal, and the hand of the Lord was on him there. And I looked, behold, as I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. 
and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight, went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wings of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance were like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro, like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of pearl, and the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went, and their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims, I wonder if they were spinners. The rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures, there were the likeness of an expanse shining like awe-inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another. And each creature had two wings covering its body. And as they went, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal like the appearance of fire, enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Okay, that's pretty weird. Uh I know, I was trying to look up images, because as you were going through, like this is what, I don't even know if that's right. No, those are terrible. So I'll tell you what the list. <laughs> I, I am, I'm like going through, I'm like, which one is it? There's so many different options. Yeah, it's, it's an omni wheel. What's, What's an omni wheel? That's what my, that's what my, uh, uh, when we did, for some reason we had to, oh, because we did the prophets when we did Ezekiel. They're like, what is that? I said, it's an omni wheel. They're like, what's an omni wheel? Okay, an omni wheel is a wheel that can turn in any direction. So it looks like a regular rim and it can roll, but the tire itself is a wheel that can go this way. So even though it's pointed this way, it can roll sideways on those wheels. So imagine, think of a bicycle tire. And instead of the tire being a tire, imagine it being little rollers set yeah. perpendicular to the wheel so that it can just turn any which way. On the wheel. They use them for uh, robots a lot, actually. They're kind of okay. cool. That's what I think of when I see that. When I hear that, it's like, okay, how does that work? Well, it can turn any direction without turning because it's an omni wheel. Uh, Batman's, what was it in? Batman, the Batmobile in the Christian Bale Batman, where he can bail out of the Batmobile and the front two wheels become a motorcycle. Yeah. And they can turn sideways as well as forward. That's like an omnibus. It's like that. So, Batman. It's Batman. It's not Batman. Mm. <laughs> okay. Okay. Watch. Like that dad type. We found Batman in the Bible. Mm-hmm. The Batmobile. The Batmobile. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so this is a weird vision, right? So Ezekiel's bizarre. But you can see where John pulls his imagery from in this chapter. So first of all, it says this wonderful phrase, after this. 
after this means immediately after the first three chapters we just read. So the whole thing with the seven letters. So he's still on the beach. He's still having church on the beach in, in Patmos, right? And he's had these visions. And as soon as he has the visions and gets dictated the seven letters that he's supposed to send, after this, immediately after this, boom, he's seeing more, right? It's a heck of a day. After this, immediately, behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the spirit. Now, in the spirit means different than I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, like he started. How do you say that? He said... Revelation to the position that he made known as to return more witness to him also. Da, 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 da. Why am I not seeing that? That's weird. Remember, you were saying when he was on the beach and he was praying, so essentially he's at his church. Yes. Yeah. Right there, verse 10. It's a lot further down, I thought. So I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Okay, so he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He's doing church. When he's in the spirit in chapter 4, it's the same phrase, but it means something different. When it says, and immediately, I, once I was in the spirit, that means, okay, now he's, now he's seeing, he's been pulled mentally and physically into this vision. So... He's not, ju- he's not just seeing it on the beach. He's not just seeing it on the beach. He's not just looking behind him and there's Jesus and he's getting his dictation. Now it's like all of a sudden, now he's like dream sequence. Okay, this is all he's seeing. Yeah, um, experience. Doctor Strange. Mm. <laughs> so we also found Doctor Strange. Kind of like Doctor Strange, yeah. Yeah, tiny bit. <laughs> So, I've been watching too many movies. <laughs> I really hope the next Doctor Strange movie is good because I really don't care. I love all the Marvel stuff. Uh, I thought they did an okay job with the movies, but and especially over such a length of time to keep us interested in it. But like these secondary characters, I could not care less about some of them. It's like or or like uh, Venom. I, the comic books are kind of neat, but not a movie. I really don't care that much about him. That was good. Like is it? Venom. Is it? No, I really like Venom. So I, I still haven't seen. I have still haven't seen Black Panther, just because yeah. that was just because eh, okay. yeah. it just like looked like the writing wasn't mm-hmm. that great. But we're not talking about Marvel. <laughs> I really hope the new Suicide Squad movie is good. It, the trailer looked amazing. Okay, enough about comic books. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so after this means right after chapters one through three. Some people hold that John had many visions, not one long continuous vision. There are other places in Revelation that will refute that he had many visions. This is one log. It's not like he comes back the next day and this happened. It's like he just, this whole thing goes bam into his head one afternoon on the beach. Wow, can you imagine? Uh, To the best of our knowledge. And again, you know, our salvation doesn't hinge on whether he had many visions or one vision, but it seems like the text is telling us this is all one long vision. He gets all of this at once. Okay, a door standing open in heaven. uh, John is granted access to God's heavenly throne room. You are going to see transitions in this book. Every time there's a transition between scenes, you're often going to see a sign or an opening. So like here, all of a sudden, I was immediately in the spirit and behold, a door standing open. Okay, something new is about to happen. Walk through the door, right? Uh, some false teachers will want to use this. At once I was in the spirit and behold a throne, a door and throne. Okay, they use that for the rapture. I don't know how they get the rapture out of this, but they do. They will use this verse as, and other ones as evidence for a rapture. There's not a rapture. Sorry, that's from reading this book incorrectly. And like uh, the repeated visions are happening consecutively and you wind up getting Jesus coming back more than once. No, no, no. 
Okay, the first voice. Who was the first voice? Who first spoke to him? Who was it all the way back at the beginning? Who is the one who is and who was and who is to come? Jesus. Jesus, Mm -hmm. right. So now Jesus is speaking to him again. Which, if you have a red, 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 red letter Bible, it's in red. So oh, mine's kinda, in red. It so kind of tells you. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like I knew that answer. So, <laughs> yeah, so that is Jesus speaking. And then um, he's not going to do it so much after. But for now, Jesus is the one speaking directly to him. Uh, like a trumpet. Trumpets are a symbol for a message from God, like a herald angel. Like what does a herald do? He blows a trumpet. So the trumpets... Trumpets are the symbol of here comes a message from God. And then that phrase, uh, I will show you what must take place after this. Uh, Dr. Brighton translates the Greek as what things are necessary to come about quickly. It's a little wordy, but it's a exact translation of what the Greek means, what it actually implies. So not just that these things must take place after this, but they are necessary that they come about quickly. Interesting. And at once I was in the spirit. So the Greek is different. It's not the same Greek as when he was standing on the beach a minute ago. Uh, It's the sense of being whisked away in a spiritual vision. And you will see that uh, happen to Ezekiel in chapter eight and Ezekiel chapter 11. Uh, You'll also see it in second Corinthians 12, where Paul talks about it happening to him. Okay, verse 3. The appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Okay, precious stones are always symbolic of the majesty of the divine presence. So whenever they start talking about precious stones, precious stones symbolize the majesty of God's divine presence, which, of course, we cannot stand in front of. You would die. And because John's in a vision, he can see it because he was physically there. You can't, you can't look on the glory of the Lord and live, right? Okay, so all of these stones have significance. So Jasper, first one. Jasper is opaque. Uh, it can translate as rock crystal. It is always associated with majesty and with holiness and with purity. And then carnelian, that's a neat word, uh, in is it Latin or Greek? Latin. It's sardius. Uh, it's a blood red stone, and it's associated with wrath and judgment. Mm. And then emerald is green, or it can be a colorless. The word can be used for a colorless crystal that reflects prismatic colors. Uh, is always associated with mercy. And then. Uh, of course, if it refracts the colors of the rainbow, that makes sense to us why it would be a symbol for mercy because of, you know, the rainbow after the flood. Which brings us to the rainbow. Uh, around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an em- emerald. Uh, the word rainbow in Greek is iris. Like the iris, so it's an iris or halo. So the word halo in Greek is iris. Uh, which connects this again to the covenant with Noah. So when you take all three of these symbolic stones together, what do you get? So you have majesty, holiness, and purity, wrath and judgment, and then mercy. Majesty, holiness, and purity. And then you have wrath and judgment. And then you have mercy and a covenant. So if you put all three of those together, you get before the fall, after the fall, and after the the promise. So you have the fall, after the fall, and the promise. So in miniature, it shows you right there in the symbolism of God's majesty. In miniature, you see the whole story of us, right? Because that's our story. We fell, we received mercy, and then we received the promise. Uh, So you have law and gospel, you have all kinds of stuff there. And then we see the throne of God and 
God the Father described. We don't see his face. We don't see any details. John still can't behold his true majesty even in in the spirit form. Or maybe he's physically there. It's hard to say. Likewise, we are in the now and the not yet. That's what we are. So we're in this Lutheran's love paradox, in case you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> so we are in this constant, like that constant state of tension between saint and sinner, mm-hmm. right? That duality we have. There is this constant tension between the now and the not yet. You know, we get the Old Testament, the Old Testament people that believed in the promise also lived in that tension. So you had David who believed in the promise and that saved him his faith in that promise. So he lived, he knew that promise was to come, but he never saw that promise fulfilled in this life. So he, he lived in the not yet. Now his faith kept him grounded, but the not yet is what he hoped in. We do the same thing. You know, we have forgiveness of sins, life and salvation in Christ now, but that is not perfected until the not yet, not till the last day. So, we're regenerated baptismally. Our sins are forgiven. Our old Adam dies every day. We wake up and he dies. He's drowned. And every day we sin and he comes back and repeat. And that is the now. That is that is our life now. But that regeneration, that renewal is not complete to the last day. And then it's he's dead for good. So that is the, that is the duality that we live in. Uh, so that is what we talk about when we say the a foretaste of the world to come. So I'm maybe getting ahead of ourselves. So what's happening in the divine service? Because if you look at this throne room, that's what the sanctuary is modeled after, right? That's what the temple was modeled after, the throne room in heaven. God said, this is where you're going to build it because this is what my throne room looks like. And then we do the same thing. That's why, you know, candle stands and incense and all that. Uh, and then in the communion liturgy, when we say, you know, Therefore, the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Well, how do we do that? Because they're there. They're here now. In that liturgy, all the company of heaven is here. Heaven has come to earth, right? Heaven comes to earth in that sacrament. And so we are worshiping with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. The same ones we're going to see worshiping in this next chapter in the throne room in heaven. That's what's going up and on in the chancel during the communion liturgy. But you can't see it. But it's there. So we can legitimately say with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, singing holy, holy, holy. This is where the holy, holy, holy comes from. Uh, that is where Christ comes to us in, in, with and under the bread and wine. So he's really there. So they're really there. We can't see him, but we're also really there connected to every Christian at every all, true altar that is receiving the body and blood of Christ at that time. So all, everybody that had communion today, they were there with us when we had communion. And we were with them when they had communion, along with all the company in heaven and all the people that have ever had communion and all the people that are ever going to have communion all at the same time. That's amazing. That blows your mind. When you start telling people that have never really thought of it before, because that's what the Bible says, you're going to look at that and go, what? It's like, yeah. So you are, you are communing with everybody that's ever going to commune, that ever has communion. We're all there because when heaven comes to earth, heaven is outside of time and space. So it makes sense. There is no time. There is no space. There is, there's only God. That's where God is. That's what heaven means. So when God created the heavens and the earth, that's the sky and the space. You know, where heaven, where God lives, that's where God is. That's heaven. So it's outside of time and space because God's outside of time and space. So anything that talks about time and space, throw that out the window when it comes to when God says, I'm here with this for you. That is a truly mystical, strange, crazy thing. Uh, It's fun to think about. And sometimes it's fun to just not think about it because it blows your mind. Uh, Yeah, so there's a lot going on up there when we have the Lord's Supper. Because that is where, again, that is where where heaven comes to earth and time has no meaning. All right, so John is there witnessing this. He is witnessing this foretaste of what is, is going to happen. 
Okay, verse 4, these 24 thrones, and on the thrones, 24 elders. The word elder is a fun Greek word called presbyterios, presbyteros, which is where you get the word presbyter, presbyterian, uh, which means elder. Uh, it's traditionally thought of as 12 of them are the 12 patriarchs of Israel. <laughs> and 12 of them are the 12 apostles. So you have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and that's traditionally the way they've been interpreted. Is there anything to indicate to us that that's who they are? No, just tradition. And it makes sense. Well, what do you got? You got the Old Covenant, you got the New Covenant, or 12 of them, there's 12 of them. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, it can be taken literally. It can be taken symbolically. It does not matter because they represent the saints worshiping before God in <coughs> merited glory, in merited victory, in the presence of true glory and true victory. So I say merited, you know, the, the victory and the glory is merited to us because of what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. That's why I said uh, it was imputed to us, I said today in the sermon. So his righteousness is imputed to us. It becomes ours not because we merited it, because he merited it for us. But then you have true glory and true victory, which is God on his throne, right? Uh, so it does not matter if you take it literally or symbolically that it's the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles. The number 12 is important. 12 is the numeric code for the people of God, always. So you have 12 and 12. That's, you have God's people in the Old Covenant and 12 God's people in the New Covenant, but together you get 24. So it's all God's people, Old and New Covenant. That's all that number means. Uh, their exact identity actually is not that important. Okay, then the throne, of course, a throne always symbolizes glory, uh, and the crown always symbolizes victory. The crown is also a metaphor for honor because it symbolizes something that was a praiseworthy accomplishment. Um, for example, I have to go to Roman history for this one, but if, for example, in battle in the Roman Empire, if a general shows some just incredible bravery or uh, incredible strategy or saves the lives of all of his guys under you know, horrible odds, and one of his soldiers, oh, excuse me, I'm choking on stuff. And one of his soldiers just bends down in the grass and makes him a crown out of grass, hands it to him. That's a huge deal. So that crown symbolizes this praiseworthy accomplishment. It's called the grass crown. Uh, seems very insignificant. Well, he is entitled to wear that crown the rest of his life. That's a big deal. If he walks into a room and he's got the grass crown on, even people of higher rank than him in the military or in government have to stop what they're doing, have to salute him and kind of like bend the knee to him. Huh. Doesn't matter who they are. It could be the emperor. He's got to do it. So it's a big deal. And everybody would know if you're handed that, instantly know what that means. And it's like, okay, you're a next level leader then when you've been awarded that. So crown, you know, symbol of victory and leadership. So what does a crown of thorns mean? Hmm, same thing How about that. All right, thunder and lightning. Always, always, always we're going to see thunder and lightning and earthquakes, especially when the world ends in the book of Revelation, which it does like seven times. So there's going to be thunder, lightning, and earthquake. Thunder and lightning, always these natural forces which symbolize God's majestic and creative power, which you see in Exodus, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the Psalms, uh, you know, like the Mount of the, when we receive the Ten Commandments, the presence of God is what? A great and terrible thunder and lightning and, and smoke and cloud, right? That's the way God's presence manifested. Okay, so that's thunder. And then we get to... Five, looking at the seven torches that are the sevenfold spirit of God. So we just get the same as we got in the 
first chapter when we talked about the number seven. So it's not that there's like seven Holy Spirits or that the Holy Spirit has seven attributes. Uh, it kind of does. <laughs> but the sevenfold Spirit of God, you can look at like the gifts of the Spirit. I think there's seven of those in Ephesians, Galatians, Galatians 5, 6, 5. Uh, you can look at that. Uh, don't get too hung up on it, but uh, that sevenfold Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. Uh, sea of glass like crystal. Normally you're going to see in Revelation that the sea is a symbol of chaos and evil, uh, especially in chapter 13. But here it is portrayed as tame and beautiful. Uh, yeah, so it's non-threatening. Usually the sea is threatening. Uh, in Jewish pseudepigraphical literature, I actually said the word right, so pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigraphical literature is literature that is not a part of the Jewish Bible. Uh, and it's probably not written by the person whose name's on the book, like the Book of Enoch. It's not written by Enoch, uh, but it's a neat book. Uh, and the Book of Enoch is kind of referenced a lot in Revelation. Uh, so their book's not included in the Jewish Bible, but they are held by tradition as being important. So that's the books of Enoch, the book of Jubilees, the book of the Watchers. Uh, in all of those, the tradition of the sea in heaven is a actual firmament okay, that separates heaven's waters from the waters of the earth, uh, which then combined to flood the earth for the flood. Uh, the glassy sea is a reminder of God's separation from his creation and the people's separation from God's glory. And you can look at that in Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 1 Peter 1. And the waters are a reminder of God's judgment over the creation. Uh, in particular, according to Dr. Brighton, who wrote the Concordia Commentary on Revelation, uh, it reminded John that while he and God's people were still of the earth, right, they were separated from that eternal glory, which in faith they longed to inherit. So there's the in, not of, in the, uh, no, that's of the world. That, that's the uh, now and not yet. So, you know, you're part of the world now. That's the not yet. That's not where, not where you're going. So sin is the cause of the separation, right? So you could say the sea is symbolic of the judgment over sin. So this is sea separates us. You gotta have a name for the gulf that separates God from man. Call it a sea. Uh, that's the way it's depicted. All right, so now verses six to eight, the four winged creatures. Um, and they're creatures. I don't know if some translations put beasts. I think that this put beasts. I, I remember reading beasts. Ours says creatures. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did I say beasts? Yeah, beasts. So that's King James. Uh, it's not, that is not the Greek word for beast. The Greek, it's the Greek word for creature, zoa, like where we get zoology and zoo and all of that stuff. So zoa, living creatures, not beasts. Uh, John does not call them cherubim, but check out Isaiah 6. He does not call them seraphim. But check out Isaiah or Ezekiel chapter one and Ezekiel chapter ten. It's clear from the way they're described that that, that they are they are the seraphim. Um, they're described differently in Revelation than they are in Ezekiel. What was the difference? Did you catch it? How many faces do they have? In, they had four faces, right? In in the other one, they in had the, two faces. In the other one, they had, no, the other one, they had four. In here, what does it actually say about them? The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The fourth living creature, like an eagle. And the other one, like a man. Third man, fourth is right. flying. So. But in, in, uh, flying. in Ezekiel, all each of them had four faces. Right, these ones like one had the face of one of the creatures, and one had one kind of face. Uh, is that on purpose? Is that a different description, or is it because of where John is standing? 
I think it's where John is standing. Maybe I read into it too much. It's possible. Uh, but I've heard other people say this too. So John, immediately he's in the spirit and he saw a door standing in heaven and he's looking through the door. So if you're standing and looking at four living creatures surrounding the throne that have four faces from the right angle, you're only going to see one of the four on each of them. So that's what some people think the reason is. And it could also be just to draw attention to the fact, no, I'm not describing them just like they were in Ezekiel. This is what I saw. This is what they represent. Isn't this similar to the Ark of the Covenant? Hmm? Were they? Was there's cher- yeah, there's cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. No, oh, but I thought I read something. I have to look it up. Keep going. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, tradition regarding the four living creatures: uh, the lion is always associated with Mark. The ox is always associated with Luke, especially in art. Uh, the man is uh, Saint Matthew, and the eagle is John. Uh, so the lion. St. Mark uh, is also uh, associated with fire and with the royal office. Ox, St. Luke, associated with the earth and with the priestly office. The man, St. Matthew, associated with air and Christ's human nature. And then the eagle, St. John, associated with water and the gifts the Holy Spirit grants the church. That's just tradition regarding those four creatures that you will see. So you always see, when you see me wear my white stole, you'll see all four of those. I've got the four evangelists on it. Uh, but you'll see a lot of stained glass windows or you see pictures of like which event you'll see an an evangelist saint some saint who's an evangelist in art and he's writing and you're like which one is it well if there's an ox sleeping next to him you know that that's luke you know and if it's uh you see an eagle somewhere in the picture you know that's john that's just the way they did it in art so it's kind of fun if you go to art museum and you see saints depicted when you know these little symbol things you know how to decode what, what the artist is trying to show you. And then that helps you know how to sort out other things in the painting, which is kind of neat. Uh, so these creatures go wherever God goes in any direction. Right? Uh, in Revelation, they're in heaven and they're stationary, but they go wherever God goes. And they have eyes without and within. That's weird. That's one of the weirdest things. Things have eyes inside and out, right? Nothing escapes their sight. They see everything, uh, which symbolizes the unending vigilance of the heavenly host. Uh, And you see there's a group of them called the Watchers. And you see that in the book of Enoch. Uh, All of the books of Enoch is also in Ezekiel a little bit. Uh, But they're not called Watchers. Uh, but these watchers are a beloved thing from uh, from uh, apocryphal literature or Jewish literature. Uh, if you watch the weird version of Noah with Russell Crowe, did, did I see that one? Is that when they had the rock creatures? Yeah, the rock. Yeah. Okay, the rock creatures. Okay, the <laughs> rock creatures. Those were the watchers. Why they depicted them that way, I do not know. <laughs> But those were the watchers. Okay. In, in case you're wondering, like, where in the world did this guy get this from? It's from the book of Enoch, a lot of it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not, everybody, that's not in the Bible. Well, he's not trying to depict the biblical flood account. It's the book of Enoch it account. That's kind of a strange thing. <laughs> well, look at the guy I direct. That's Aaron Aronofsky. He's a Kabbalist Jew. He's into that stuff. So all of his movies are weird. But yeah, his, that Noah movie was weird because it was from the book of Enoch. It's not from, uh, not from Genesis. So everybody's like, ah, oh, well, this is not in my Bible. It's like, look at who made the movie. He's not a Christian. He's a Jew. And not only is he a Jew, he's a Kabbalist. So he's into Jewish mysticism, which is really weird and interesting, but really weird. So that's where the Watchers came from, but they're not described in the book of Enoch as rock creatures either. But they had to take poetic license. Right, even in, in Ezekiel, even the wheeled vehicles had eyes. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's weird. All right, so enough about them. We'll talk more about seraphim later. And then verses 8 through 11. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And they reach good. Did I skip a chapter? I did. We're not on that chapter. We're on chapter 4. Holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Uh, and then again in, in verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. 
So this is the beginning, and this song goes on through Revelation. This is the beginning of the great te Deum. So the great te Deum Laudamus, which means the O God we praise. It's just Latin. Uh, so the great te Deum, the song in the wedding feast without end, uh, which we then copy. It's like, why do we sing the things we sing? Because that's what they're singing in heaven. So we're singing the same thing with angels and archangels and all company of heaven. Awesome. All right, and that song goes on for all eternity. And you will also see where this is the feast comes from. It's like, this is feast in Revelation. Okay, that's chapter four. That's chapter four. Uh, do we want to stop there? Because we can't finish chapter five. I don't think we would finish chapter five. We could try. Yeah, you know what? We can do chapter five. It's not that long. I wish I always do that. Oh, we can't do chapter five. Yeah, we can. All right, chapter five. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, were there you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. That's a pretty incredible vision right there. So anyway, that's where this is the feast comes from. Uh, fun fact, this is the feast is in the old, the Lutheran hymnal, TLH. Is it? Yeah. It just, it's in that section with all of the uh, like canicles and stuff. At the beginning, that doesn't have any music. It's just the text. This is the feast. It's right in the middle of all. Mm -hmm. Someone told me that. It's like, no, it's not. It's like, yeah, it is. So I'll tell you what section to look and see if you can find it. It's like, holy cow, it's there. It's right there. They're like, what is this? It's new. It's like, no, it's not. Plus, it's right from the Bible. So why do people have a problem with it? I didn't like it at first. The first time I ever sang this as a feast. It's like, well, yeah. The music is very different yeah. from what we normally do. Yeah. And I think that's why people were uncomfortable with it. But it's like when you start looking at the, the words, and you're like, wow, this is right out of it. Revelation. This is this is exactly what we should be singing here. This for Lutherans, we just don't like change. No, we don't. Mm -hmm. It's just like you know the people that are King James only. You know, King James, the King James version was good enough for Saint Paul. It's good enough for me. I don't think that. <laughs> what? Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So chapter five. Chapter five. The scroll and the lamb. Uh, this. This chapter starts to paint the image of the victory of Christ, which is what this book is all about, right? The enthronement of the Lamb. It shows us through the whole next section, which is about this book with the seven seals, is going to show us the entire history of the world, right? And the, the character of heavenly worship very heavily underscores the glory of Christ's redeeming work. So Christ did all of this for us and the character, the worship of him in heaven has to match that, right? This is what Jesus did for us and this is how the hosts of heaven worship him. So maybe we should take our worship here a little more seriously too. 
it's a good argument against, I mean, I'm not going to hash against any other kind of worship forms. I, everybody knows I'm not a big fan of contemporary worship, but, but liturgical worship, boy, <laughs> there's a lot of that going on in heaven. <laughs> That's exactly what's going on. You know, and if we, they are doing it glorifying Christ because of his redeeming work. That's why they have this quality of worship and we're just copying it. It's a pale copy of it, but it still is a copy of it. Okay, because our world, apart from Christ, there's no hope, right? But because Jesus was slain and because he conquered death, his people are ransomed. We have the hope of glory. So the Christ, remember Christ is a title, not a name. So the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, is enthroned and he carries out the prophetic message to strengthen the saints and his church in carrying out its mission on earth. How does he do that? He comes to us in word and sacrament. So we'll get to that. So number, verse one, verse one, the right hand, of course, is the hand from which salvation is worked. The right hand is always the hand of strength. Left hand is always the hand of, because people don't trust left-handed people. Okay, the scroll. It's true. I mean, the, 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 what is the what is the word for for left hand left in uh, Latin? Sinister. Really? Yeah, sinister. And which which we directly borrow our word sinister for evil comes from the word for left. You know, in magic, when you talk about magic, the right hand path. There's two paths. The right hand path, the path of righteousness. The left hand path is always the path of the devil, right? So the dark side. The dark side is the dark side. Come to the dark side. We have cookies. So, yeah. So yeah, the left left side is bad in traditional symbolism. So the scroll. Oh, probably. Probably. So. Okay. So the the word scroll and behold. Yeah. So I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within, within and on the back. So scroll, the Greek word is biblion. It can mean book, codex. This is a codex. Right? This is a codex. Pages bound into a cover. That's a codex or a scroll rolled up. Biblion can mean either of those. Um, this one is written on both sides. It's probably a scroll, like a wound up scroll. Written on both sides, meaning uh, nothing else other than it's complete. Right? That it is written on both sides. It contains everything. Everything's in there. There's not another volume. Do not, oh, now you have to turn to scroll number two. It's, every, it's w written within, without, it's covered in writing. It's complete. It's sealed with seven seals. What's the importance of the number seven? Again. The number seven is that which only God can do or has done or will do. So there's seven seals. And nobody on heaven and on earth can open them. Why? Well, because there's seven. Because it's that which only God can do. So that's why, oh, enter the Lamb. All right. So this book is the book of the history of the world. This is the history of earth. That's what the book of the seven seals is. It's our history. And you'll see that as we go through it, the first, this vision. Okay, the, the strong angel or the mighty angel, that's a great Greek word too, megalos. Megalos angel, right? Mighty. Uh, which is where we get the prefix mega from, right? Uh, so he had a loud voice. He's a different rank of angel than the others. Uh, there are different angels that serve different functions in this book. This angel is an actual angel. He is not an ordinary messenger. He is not uh, like the pastors that the letters are being written to in the other chapters. This is an actual angel, 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 angel. Okay. Then verses two through five talks about who is worthy, uh, axios, who is worthy, who is fit to do this and why, and what names is he called? Okay, you have the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. They're all messianic titles. So you have Genesis 49. It can give you all these references, but it's Genesis 49, Numbers 24, Isaiah 42, 
Isaiah 49, Malachi 4, 4th Ezra 11. Where's 4th Ezra? It's in the Apocrypha. Is that in the Apocrypha? Or is that a, did they not even put that in the Apocrypha? Anyway, 4th Ezra, yeah. 4th Ezra 11 has that. That's in the Apocrypha. So he's got all these titles, you know, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and then the lamb who was slain yet lives, and he has seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. So what can the lamb see? Everything. Everything. Everything that was, everything that is, and everything that will ever be. And then he has seven horns. What does a horn signify? And I mean like a like a horn. It's a horn signify. Animal has a horn is what? Strong, powerful, right? It's a rhino, powerful? Yeah. Because he's got a great big horn, right? So this lamb, a lamb who has horns, by the way, right? So lamb, you think little, little lamb, right? Basically, this is it's a mighty lamb. He's got seven horns. So that just means, and they've tried to draw it. I've tried to draw it. I think I've got an idea for a pretty good drawing that other people haven't done. But, you know, they'll, they'll just draw like literally like seven going around. It looks ridiculous. Uh, but they try to depict this with the seven eyes and the seven horns. And it's... Some of them are just, they're horrifying to behold. They're scary. Uh, some of them are just bad, but some of the good ones are just like, that is terrifying. <laughs> I'm glad it's on our side. I'm glad that thing's on our side. Yeah. So the seven horns, he's all powerful. He's got all the power, and he's got all the sight. Uh, the significance of the seven horns, you can look again. I've been referred to the Book of Enoch a lot, because it is referred to a lot in Revelation. First Enoch chapter 90. It's not that long a book, but it's got a lot of chapters. Uh, Chuck talks about that. Then we come to verse 7. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. When he'd taken the scroll, everybody fell down before the Lamb and worshipped him. So what is significant of his receiving the scroll? So right now, who's got it? Father's got it. Father's got it in his right hand. He's sitting on his throne. He's got the book. And they're like, well, who can open it? Like, Ooh, the lamb. The lamb's the one that's going to open it. So he just goes and takes it. And you can see in, da let's look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel's another good one for this. Daniel chapter 7 says, Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is the Father, right? And was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Okay, so that language is um, almost made it, almost made a, Avengers reference. Okay, I'm not going to do that. It's going to make a Thor reference. So it's like it's like in the movie when Thor is going to be become king of Asgard, you know, and he's marching down and he's like throwing Mjolnir up in the air, you know, and his father's sitting there with a, Odin's sitting there with the with the spear, right? And they're going to it's going to be the transfer of power, but then something happens and nope, you got to wait, boy, I'm not ready yet. That is the significance of his receiving the scroll. It is a it is. Jesus is glorification, right? His glorification, he's being handed the story of us, the story of our history. He's being handed that and it's being put in, under his dominion. So everything that ever was, will be, and is, is under his control. All right, so he's sharing the power with the Father. He's, sat, he's seated at his right hand, right? So... It is the investiture of authority. So this moment in time, even though there's no time in heaven, I know, but this exact moment in this vision, it's one of those things. So what happened when Jesus ascended? What happened? So the disciples saw him leave in a cloud. And like, okay, I got to wait for Pentecost now. What happened? Well, this is what happened. At that moment, Jesus ascended and he was glorified <coughs> and his authority is given to him. 
it is what happened at his ascension where the Father gives him authority over all things, where his glorification comes after his humiliation. So he's humiliated. He has to become a human being to save us. That's his humiliation in his life, and his death, and his resurrection. And then when he ascends into heaven, it says, and he ascended into heaven and sits down at the right hand of the Father. That's this. That's the whole idea of sitting down at the right hand of the Father and being invested with that power from the Father. So that's why everybody falls down. Everybody falls down, boom, on their faces. So you have different prayer postures, right? What do we do when we pray? Stand up or you kneel. And there's one other posture, and that's prostrate on your face. Let arms and legs spread face down. Uh, Like if you look at the Luther movie, when Luther takes his vows to become a priest, he's face down on the floor. That's, That's what that is. So this is what all these kings who have crowns, all these elders, right? They throw their crowns ahead of them, which is a symbol of their authority they perceive from God. They take that off. They doff their cap, right? They doff their crown. And then they prostrate themselves before the Lamb. That's worship. That's prayer posture. Uh, And then, of course, you have the harps. They each have a harp, which is the instrument of prayer, right? It's an instrument that accompanied the singing of the psalms. And then incense, which, of course, is always a symbol of prayer. I will let my uh, the uh, Vespers uh, liturgy. Um, I let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Uh, our liturgy says. Okay, so just as the smoke of incense rises into the air, so do our prayers ascend to the ears of God. All right, and then now in, in verse nine and ten, we have the continuation of the great this new great new song, the great Te Deum. All Christians are priests in equal degree, says Martin Luther. The priesthood of all believers, as it has come to be called, who are called to proclaim the good news of salvation by grace through faith for the sake of Christ to all people. That is our priesthood. That is what we are called to do. Not all people are pastors. We know that. Uh, But we are who are called to preach and administer the sacraments according to Christ's institution. But We are all called to proclaim the gospel. Uh, Although, right here, this is the proof text, one of those proof text verses that uh, they will use uh, to say that's why ladies can be pastors. Because, oh, it says right there. Right there. You've made all of them from every tribe and language of people. You've made them a kingdom and priests to our gods. Lady priests. No. Not what that says. (laughs) Okay. Uh, or anybody moved by the Spirit can call themselves a pastor. Anyway. Now, verse 11. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. A myriad is about 10,000, by the way. So the angels number in the millions, probably billions, since we each have one, Right? The number 10 simply means, the number code for the number 10 always means olive. So squaring or cubing that number means I really mean all of them. So 10 squared is 100. So if you say 100, I mean I mean all of them. And if you say 10,000, 10 cubed, I really seriously mean all of the angels are singing. That's what that emphasis means. Uh, So is it a, a literal number? No. It just means there's millions of them and they're all singing. Can you imagine what that sounds like? You can also use it to mean the the angels are innumerable. You cannot count them. Uh, And Daniel chapter 7 talks about that a little bit too. So here in verse 12, John records the form of angelic worship. What does it sound like when the angels sing? Sounds like what we do on Sunday morning because we're copying it. So the form of angelic worship is the same as the form of our worship on earth. So we join with angels and archangels in all company of heaven. Verse 13, And I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and all that is in the sea and all of them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory for might forever and ever. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Philippians 2.10 And with the exception of God the Father and the Holy Spirit, everyone in heaven worships Jesus. 
It's got to be quite a sight. And then the Lamb's going to open the seals next week, and we'll get into chapter 6. So that was a spot. I always forget chapter 5 is quite short. These two chapters go together. Any questions? Comments? I did go kind of fast. There are some kind of cool Greek words in these two chapters that are kind of fun. I like doing those with kids because they all of a sudden they'll, they'll remember like, oh, the word mega, that comes from Greek. You know? And then when they see that mega prefix, they'll know what it means because they don't teach them that stuff anymore. We have to learn all that. But they don't say, oh, yes, we'll learn this word. Well, if you learn what all the prefixes mean and the suffixes mean, you'll know what a lot of other words mean. But... I didn't learn those. <laughs> hmm? Me those. Really? Oh, that's, that's where we'll stop for this week.